Well, we do things a little different here at Ignited when we do our communion. And I believe that it's the responsibility of the shepherd to break bread for you and to break bread with you. And so that's the way we're going to do it here and the way we've always done it. So if you'll just give me a minute, I want to share with you about the communion. And then you can come get the elements and then we'll, we'll break it together and have it together. But on the night that Jesus was betrayed, we know the story. It's an amazing story. And it's a very powerful story. How that he took the bread and he broke it. He blessed it and he gave it. And as he did that, he said that this was his body. And then he took the cup, which represented the blood of the New Testament. And he gave it to them and he said, as oft as you do this, do it in remembrance of me and drink it all. What an awesome opportunity we have this morning to partake of his body. It is a reflection and a remembrance of everything he did for us on the cross of Calvary. And I think that many times we miss the season of Christmas and we just say, well, it was his birth. It's greater than that. His birth gave us access to his death and to his life. And so that's why we celebrate communion at this time, because we're so grateful that he is the Alpha and he is the Omega, the beginning and the ending. And guess what? He's everything in between. So he took the bread and remember that he blessed it and he, he gave it. And I'm going to do that this morning. I'm going to break the bread. And then I'm going to ask that you would come up and take a piece of the bread. And those watching right now, I speak a blessing over you. And I pray that you feel the power of the Holy Spirit like we do in this house. And that you would partake of these elements with us. And that the blessing of Jehovah would be upon you in Jesus' name. I break the bread in the name of the Lord Jesus remember his broken body remember everything that he did father i bless this bread i bless your body i bless your body not only for what you did on the cross but i bless your body universally that as we partake of communion that not only divine health and holiness would be upon us but unity within the body of christ in jesus name to so come take Hallelujah. you as you have partaken of the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Father, for those that are here today, I bless each and every one. I speak divine health and healing in every person's body. I speak that by the stripes that Jesus received, we are made whole. Father, I declare in Jesus' name, these that are upon the cross will be born again according to Acts 16, 31, according to John 3, 16, that Father God, that none of these will be left orphaned, but all of them will know you as Lord and Savior. Father, that they will be redeemed. Father, as we break bread, as we partake of the blood of the New Testament, we declare that that same blood has the same power that it did. And Father, I speak a birthing of new life over each and every name here. As this congregation agrees and we believe that nothing is impossible for God. We touch and we agree for miracle salvations tomorrow morning, even today during this holiday season. We believe for mighty miracles. Father, we love you today. We thank you that we're able to break bread in remembrance of the Lamb. I'm so grateful for the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we honor you with all that we have. One more time, just lift your hands across the sanctuary. Say thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the amazing grace. Somebody's being healed right now in your body over communion. Somebody's being touched because you broke bread in sincerity with God. A new relationship is coming, new wine is coming, new anointing is coming, new assignments are coming, new giftings are coming. Because of your fresh covenant with God. Father, I thank you. Something, something wonderful is being born in this house. And I look forward to the miracles. In Jesus, Jesus, mighty name. Can everybody say hallelujah? How about Merry Christmas? And happy birthday, Jesus. <laughs> Woo! Hallelujah. You may be seated. Yeah, give the Lord a clap offering. Bless him for his goodness, his mercies, and his tender loving kindness. Can you make it? She's hung up. She's hung up on Jesus. Amen. I was going to give you that. <laughs> Just don't rip the wall down. Amen. Wow, what a wonderful service, amen? What a wonderful Savior as well. Thank you, guys. Those were uh, great, great songs. I love the Christmas songs, amen? There are certain older songs that I love because they allow me to holler. Uh, I don't know how to sing, but I know how to holler. And uh, those are the ones I like to do. And especially, uh, I exalt thee. Man, that one I just, I ripped that one. Uh, I want to move on into our service. Uh, those watching live stream, I know everything's kind of flipped and done differently. Uh, we've already had our offering time. Our announcements have already been made. Um, so we could just flow into this anointing, into this opportunity to worship and, um, and to bless the Lord. I do want to say happy birthday to Brother John. We love Brother John. Amen. Uh, those are... Th it's not John the Baptist. No, it's not John the Baptist. Uh, also, uh, the anniversary is when? The anniversary was yesterday. That's right. Uh, it's the birthday was right. I handled all that already. I just did it all one big. I mean, how many people you know have a birthday, <clears throat> husband and wife have a birthday right next to each other and an anniversary and then it's Christmas? I think they planned it that way personally. <clears throat> I don't know about the birth part, but... Um, That'd be a little, little difficult, but uh, we do wish you guys uh, blessings on all of your milestones and, and landmarks and breakthroughs and miracles, <laughs> the miracle of marriage. Uh, but anyways, come on up, brother. Let me have my, 
my weapon. Amen. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, service this morning, this communion service. I do sense and feel the power of the Holy Spirit in this house. And um, again, uh, I love this time of the year. Uh, it's a great opportunity to witness to people for sure. And, uh, you know, to us as believers, the birth of Christ is every day. Amen. Our salvation is every day. It's felt every day. And so it doesn't have to be a specific day. But man, people's hearts are really, really open during this time. And so uh, I'm just grateful to use it as a, as a witnessing tool of the birth of our Savior. Heavenly Father, I ask that you'd hide me now behind the shadow of the cross and let Jesus be glorified only. That that name, the name that's above every name, will be lifted on high. Thank you for the opportunity to break bread. I'm so grateful that I could break bread with my family, those that are here and those that are far away. So glad that I can stand up before the nations of the world and I can, I can be a witness to the greatness of my God and the birth of my Savior. Father, I ask now that you would hide me behind the shadow of the cross so that Jesus would get all the praise and all the honor and all the glory, and that you would take this word and you would send it to the nations of the world, and that lives would be changed by the power of truth. I thank you for it, and in Jesus' name, everybody say amen. I know all across America, uh, people will be having services that are just so full of tradition, and as you know, we're not a tradition-filled church. Uh, communion is not tradition. Communion is a way of life. Communion is something that you should do on a daily basis. If it's not with the elements alone, it's with your praise to him. And so I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that we could just do this today and celebrate it. But I also have a message from heaven to give to you and to the nations of the world. Uh, I don't get a day off, as a lot of preachers do. They use holidays for a day off, the time off, and you know, have the children come do this, and they do that, and they don't have to preach or anything. Uh, but I, I specifically asked the Father, I said, what do you want me to do? I mean, we can do communion, and we can sing silent night until it's nighttime. And, uh, but he said, I want you to give this word, and so I'm going to give this word to you and to the nations. He said, the time has come for the nations to consider the hour of their existence, to realize the days are growing shorter, my time to deal with the Gentiles is coming to an end, and few realize that it's at their door. Finish your work with haste. Finish the task at hand, for soon the floodgates of grace will swing open wide, releasing man's fate. How many of all know it's nothing but the grace of God that's keeping us from the tsunami that is coming? You have been given a gift, a lease on life, but many fail to see how precious this gift is. Few take advantage of this treasured gift. My gift to man has limits, and it is sought after like a man's last breath. This gift is time. Reflect and realize that this is the hour and day of salvation and grace. Realize and ponder that what you have is more precious than silver and gold. It is the gift of time. Time is running out for the foolish, for those who think they control the hourglass of reality. Don't waste time. As I was preparing and seeking him, he spoke these words to me, which became the title of this message. It's called The Gift. It has nothing to do with Christmas. It was not a play of words. It's not something that I came up with to be cute and to be eloquent about. As I seriously pondered, he said, the gift. And then he gave me the word concerning time. I believe that we're on a short string, if you will, a short leash of time, not only in this uh, nation, but in the world. And if you don't believe that, your life has but a short time. For the Bible declares that life is but a vapor, and that we only have a certain time given to us in order to accomplish the destiny of God in our lives. 
And that's why I try to be as passionate as I can as a pastor and I try to push people to go to the fullness of their destiny because this is the only day you get. This is the day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. So the time that I have now is a gift from God. The time that I now possess, it is a lease from him. And I must fulfill everything I possibly can in this beginning and ending that I have. And so the Father wants this message to go to the nations of the world in this Christmas season because we first must understand that Jesus was wrapped in humanity as a gift. Humanity and time are synonymous. They walk and work together because your body and my body is like an hourglass. With each and every day, the sand passes with each and every day, we grow a little older. Well, some of you all do. But each and every day, it passes by. And the opportunity to do something yesterday is over today. And nobody's promised tomorrow. And so when I think about the birth of Jesus Christ, and I realize that he was wrapped in time frame, he was wrapped in humanity, he was wrapped in an assignment I recognize and I realize today that the gift that I have been given is more precious than breath. It's more precious than silver and gold. It's more precious than anything because it's my opportunity to do something great for God. And I believe as I minister this message to you that America is at the very end of the time frame that it's been given to do something great for God. I truly believe we've actually passed that. But the realization has not caught up with us just yet. And when the entire nation realizes it, then we'll know the hour has truly come for them. Because it is God's desire that no man perishes, but all would come to the saving knowledge. If we really believe that God desires for no man to perish, I believe we would do more work for the kingdom than we currently do. We take less time for ourselves and we would invest it into his work. Don't count it surprise when I tell you to go to Jeremiah chapter 22. Jeremiah chapter 22, again, I don't make this up. I know some people don't believe me. I was at a bookstore the other day, and I saw there's a Jeremiah Bible out there. I was like, what? What? I might need to look into getting the Jeremiah Bible. That's a big Bible for, for not a lot of chapters, amen? I don't know what it's about, but I'll have to, I'll have to look into that. Jeremiah chapter 22. I've been here before. And I guess we're going to go here again. Again, the message is called The Gift. I welcome everybody listening now in different media platforms. I love you. Merry Christmas and, and happy Hanukkah and happy birthday, Jesus. I should have covered it all. Verse 1, Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 1. Thus saith the Lord God, go down to the house of the king of Judah and speak there this word and say, hear the word of the Lord, O king of Judah, that sitteth upon the throne of David, and thy servants and thy people that enter in by these gates. Now you know the word gates there represents the place of authority, the meeting place, the place where court was being held, if you will. It was the place where they gathered together to do commerce. So it was a place of authority. I believe that the gospel of Jesus Christ should be preached in every form and fashion and every nook and cranny, if you will, of society, whether it is the White House or it's the Pimp's House or a Crack House or the State Capitol House. I believe the gospel of Jesus Christ should be 24-7, 365, continuously preaching the blessed truth. And God spoke to Jeremiah and said, son, I want you to go to that place, the place of authority, the place where people gather together and where decisions are being made. 
And so Jeremiah, as you know, was very obedient. And he said, thus saith the Lord, execute judgment and righteousness and deliver the spoiled out of the hand of the oppressor and do no wrong. Do no violence to the stranger, the fatherless, nor the widow. Neither shed innocent blood in this place. So God gave Jeremiah an assignment and a mission and a mandate to go to those places in the city, to go to the place of authority, to the meeting place, and tell the folks to do the right thing. That should be the mission and the assignment of every single preacher in America and around the world and every single Christian sitting in the seat right now and those watching and listening to me that your assignment is to go to the places and tell folks to do the right thing. But because we've been so candy-coated in our Christianity... We've become so petrified in our belief. We've become so afraid to declare and stand before people. And we want to be everybody's friend. Help me, church. We want to be everybody's buddy. And we won't stand up and declare the word of the Lord and the truth of the Lord. We have come to the place that we have cowered back and we've allowed sin to take place and let it grow like a vine and a weed upon a wall. I'm not talking about being brash and harmful, but I'm talking about being truthful to our family members, being truthful to our children, being truthful to our grandchildren, and telling them what the Bible says. Because where the church is silent, the world is very loud. And the truth of the matter is we've been so silent for long enough that the world has spoken and spun a lie into the very hearts of humanity in our nation. And now when we speak truth, they're like a dog that hears a strange sound. And the fault is not God's. The fault is not the Bible. The fault is upon the preacher and upon you and upon me because we do not live our Christianity out in the open. We only pull it out when we want to. We only pull out our confession and our testimony when we think it's profitable. But the truth of the matter is that sometimes it's not profitable and it's not convenient to tell somebody the truth. Sometimes you're going to be offended and people are going to hate you and people are not going to like you. I got a notice for you. If everybody likes you, you're not doing what you're supposed to, especially being a believer. I'm not looking for controversy. Controversy follows me. Controversy follows anybody who stands up for righteousness. And so Jeremiah is talking to Judah. He's talking to the nation of Israel. He's going to begin to speak about a gift. As I stand before you today and I declare and decree that America has a gift that we have wasted. Because we want to be politically correct in our churches. We want to be politically correct with our children, with our family members, because we want everybody to like us and to love us. How many of y'all know you ain't going to get what you thought you are going to get tomorrow anyways? I always say, if you're going to give me something, give me the receipt with it. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Thus saith the Lord. Execute judgment and righteousness. He said, you need to do something that is justice-filled. Do the things of righteousness. It amazes me as I walk upon this earth how few people do the right thing. Watch out now. Even in the house of God, even in Christianity, people who say they're with you and say they'll follow you and be there for you. It's a crying shame that we can't find people that will be loyal to their mouth. And deliver the spoiled out of the hand of the oppressor and do no wrong and do no violence to the stranger, the fatherless nor the widow, neither shed innocent blood in this place. It bears repeating because we have a 
Christian mentality that I don't want to offend anybody and I don't want anybody mad at me. Let me tell you something. You don't have to talk about Christ for somebody to be mad at you. People are just looking for a reason to be mad at you. Just give them time. <laughs> but the reality is this. That Jeremiah was told by the father, I want you to go to the gates. I want you to go to the place of authority. I want you to go to the place where it's popular. I want you to go to the place where everybody's going to see you. I want you to go to the place where you're going to be at the forefront. I want you to go to the place where it's going to cost you something for talking against the sin and the lifestyle of those in authority. I want you, Jeremiah, to go where no other, no other person or preacher wants to go. Again, I lead us back to the reality that we must stand in the marketplace of life and declare this truth in love and in power in sincerity, but we still must tell the truth if we're ever going to see this people that we love, this family, these neighbors that we love turn to Christ. There's such a famine in the world for truth. Watch verse 4. For if you do these things, you might want to highlight if. For if you do these things, the covenant of God, the blessings of God, they swing open on the hinges of if. And we don't preach that anymore. We preach it as though just because you're born again, you get carte blanche. You can do what you want to do. You can, you can sin. You can, you can hang out any way you want to. But you have your name written in the Lamb's book of life. So it really doesn't matter. You got it made. But the covenants of God, they hinge open on if, if my people... If you'll obey, if you'll follow me, if you'll carry your cross, if. But we've excluded that from our preaching today. We've excluded it from Christianity and discipleship within the church. And we've made it a free-for-all that we can do anything we want to do. And you can't tell me how to live, preacher. You can't tell me what to do with my time. You can't tell me what to do with this called life. But I'm here to tell you today you got a gift you got a gift, and you don't have much time to do something with that gift called time. For if you do these things indeed, then shall there enter in by the gates of this house king sitting upon the throne of David, riding in chariots and horses, and he and his servants and his people. Proof positive of the fact of I, that I said about if and the covenants of God. Jeremiah was told, prophesy to these people and tell them that if they will do what I told them to do, then the blessings that were upon the seed of David would come upon them. That the worshiping presence of God and the power of provision and prosperity would be theirs and it would be a perpetual blessing. In America, we used to preach this. We used to preach and declare that as long as we kept prayer in school and as long as we kept honoring God, as long as we kept honoring the house of God and the man of God and the woman of God and the word of God, God would continue to shed his grace upon this great country. He would continue to bless us as long as we kept abortion away, as long as we kept foreign gods out of our churches and out of our schoolhouses. God would bless us. But we've come to the place that we stop preaching that because we've allowed anything and everything to come into the house of God. We've allowed every entity and foreign God that has invaded foreign countries to invade this nation, including our churches. And you see it spewing out of our silver screens of Hollywood and of our TV screens and our CD players and every form and fashion of media. We've allowed the cesspool of the foreign deities and entities to saturate our nation like sewage. And Jeremiah told them, they said, if, 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 if you will stop and not allow this to take place, I will allow a perpetual blessing upon your country. 
Do you wonder why we've had leadership like we've had over the years in America? Does it make you scratch your head? Do you feel better that you voted your conscience and this and that when the reality is we get everything that we deserve? We get every leader that we deserve. We get every law that we deserve. We get every conflict that we deserve. We get every societal tear in our country for what we deserve by what we created through sin. And you think you had a hand in making a difference. The reality is the only hand that you have in making a difference is by praying and fasting and declaring and decreeing the word of God and standing up for truth and standing up for righteousness and standing up for holiness and pointing your finger under the nap of the devil at nose of the devil and say, let me tell you something. I'll grab you by the nap of the neck and I'll cast you out of my family and I'll cast you out of my schoolhouses and I'll cast you out of my church and I'll stand upon the rock of revelation that Jesus Christ is Lord and I'll preach this truth and if you don't like it turn the channel if you don't like it then shut the door if you don't like it then head on out but we've changed in America Jeremiah was giving them a gift Jeremiah was giving them a time frame to repent and there's been faithful preachers long before me who will stand upon the pulpit and declare these truths and warned America that as you continue to sin, your leadership will become more vile. That the government will become more corrupt. They would go darker and deeper and more secret. And you would not know what was taking place because of the hidden sin that you had. Your government would have the same and worse. And that's what's taking place. And so God said, Jeremiah, I want you to go to the hard place. I want you to go to a place, a spotlight. I want you to go to a place where everybody's going to look at you. See, a lot of Christians want to do their ministry in a hidden place. They want to do their evangelism where nobody sees. In other words, they do it saying, well, I, you know, I did this over here and I, I feel better and I serve the Lord. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I did this little thing over here. I'm not talking about doing your alms before men and hiding. I'm talking about the reality is that we'll say we did something for God. And the truth of the matter is we were too much of a coward to do the will of God. And so we make appeasement to ourselves and we make ourselves feel better. So he says in Jeremiah chapter 4, he said, I'm giving you a chance. I'm giving you this opportunity. If you will, if you'll just obey, if you'll just listen to what I'm telling you to do. You know, I've been thinking about this recently. In fact, I talked to a good friend of mine on the phone, a prophetic friend the other day. And we were talking about the hour that we were living in. And we were comparing notes about what God was speaking to this particular person, what God was speaking to me. And we do this quite often, probably about a month, every month or so. And I begin to share about the scales in America and how I see this unjust balance and how it has affected the Christian church, the American church, to the point where we don't understand the reality of our hour. And what I mean by that is, as we look across the landscape and we see the stock numbers and we see they're at 24,000 plus, and we see records being made within job numbers and what have you, in which I don't believe all numbers, but I listen. But the, the answer to all this and the understanding to this is you watch these scales and you see these things and they rise up and everybody gets all excited and everybody focuses upon money. And then I look at the other side of the scale, Elder, and I see the murder-suicide rate. I, I see and, and read uh, husbands and wives blowing each other away. And I look at the pedophilia, and I look at the craziness, and I look at all the radicalness taking place, and I see the scale, and I see that we're found wanting in America. And we are so deceived by numbers and by political ornaments, if you will, hung upon trees of, of deception... That we believe everything is right. And my job, like Jeremiah, my job was to look at the sin. My job was to, is to look at the shedding of innocent blood. My job is to look past all the parade that everything is fine. 
And so I stand here today and I tell the church and the world and anybody that will listen to me to not look at the things that the world presents to you in the plastic banana church that looks like everything's wonderful and everything's glorious and we're hitting the high notes. Our nation is going to hell in a handbasket and I don't know how to say it. I know tomorrow's Christmas and I know everybody's thinking about this and thinking about that, but the reality is it does not match up with the word of God. America does not match up when it comes to righteousness and holiness. And I was talking to this individual and I said, I just, I just don't, I don't see it. I, I, well, you know, this takes place and tax cuts and, and this is happening. But the reality is the scale is not balanced right. Something is wrong when we're murdering our babies, not only on the womb, but we're murdering them outside of the womb. Something is wrong when in Delta County, Colorado, they're now allowing Satanists to put out pamphlets inside the school hallway that talks about Satanism, that brings children to a place of confusion. Pamphlets that say that why is abortion wrong? The Bible doesn't say anything about abortion, they say. And so the children are inundated and they're saturated with these. And this is inside of our public schools. One of the pamphlets talks about the X-rated book called the Bible. And it shows a cartoon of a Bible and a figure that looks like a man and hands that are coming out. And he's reaching underneath the skirt of a girl talking about the perversion in the Bible. Do I have anybody that still has a pulse in this ICU ward? It's the reality of America today, but we're looking at numbers and we're looking at inflated numbers and we're looking at deception and we're looking at the wrong side of the scale. Even you that are sitting in church today, you're looking at the wrong side of the scale because your favorite preacher has been pimping, if you will, this mantra. And my job is to look past it. I was speaking to this individual and I said, I am apolitical. I don't want to be left and I don't want to be, I don't want to be on any side. I want to be on the side of the truth. I want to be side of the kingdom. I pray we do great. I pray everything's wonderful. I pray everybody gets a raise Tuesday. The only people I know getting a raise is Goldman Sachs and Wall Street. And a whole lot of government folk. But what I'm looking for, I'm not looking for numbers. I'm looking for salvation. I'm looking for deliverance. I'm looking for revival. I'm looking for the preacher and the priest. I'm looking for the elder and the deacon to rent their hearts and not their clothes and to cry out to God and say, God, we need you today. I'm looking for true repentance. I'm not looking for money. God can give me money out of the mouth of a fish. I can dig up the garden tomorrow and find Earl. For y'all in New York and Chicago, that's oil. Is anybody still here? Taking place in our schools today. Books on why not to believe. Don't believe in God. Just, there's no reason to believe in him. This is all propaganda that's being Push down our children's throat. It's not everywhere, but it's somewhere, and that's enough. So I can't go with the happy crowd that says everything's fine. I can't hang with the jolly ranchers that everything's wonderful. I can't hang around with those people that just ignore and put their head in the sand and don't realize what's taking place in our country. Right now, the Word going postal is really coming back. As a man kills his supervisor in Dublin, uh, Dublin, Ohio, outside of Columbus. You might have read about it. 20-something-year-old man kills his supervisor, and then he shoots the postmaster, kills them all. Running around naked, chasing them with a gun. We're on the lunatic fringe. We're on the crazy train. We're on a highway to hell, but everything's fine because numbers are rising. 
Why don't we look at the rise of numbers of those dying of opium? Why don't we look at the numbers of veterans who are dying by the minute through suicide? And those within the VA system that we are left there to rot. We got problems in America. And my job on this Christmas Eve is not to hide my candle under a bushel or under a rock. My job is to lift it up and to expose and declare like Jeremiah did. He said, if you'd stop these things, you'd have the blessings and you'd have righteousness and power. We don't have righteousness and power no matter how the church paints it. We don't. Are you with me at verse 5? I'm not mad yet. I'm, I'm happy. I saw a few gifts I'm going to get tomorrow. It's probably nothing I wanted, but I'll take it. Got a pair of socks last night, amen? Can't beat that. I'm wearing them right now. No, you can't look. Verse 5. But, <laughs> hey, they're polo, man. They're awesome. But if you will not hear these words, watch this. If you will not hear these words, we're not talking about Benjamin Faircloth of the Church. We're talking about the great pioneers of the faith. We're talking about the great circuit riders who used to cross this country fire blazing a trail declaring and decreeing that sin kills and the wages of sin is death. Great mighty prophets who prophesied the destruction of this country. We refuse to listen to them. In fact, if you bring their names up today, people ridicule them, castigate them. But the words are coming true today. But if you'll not hear these words, I swear by myself. This isn't Jeremiah. This one thing for me to bow up and make a threat. It's a whole other thing when God swears by him. Self. I'm trying to make this clear from this congregation and this pulpit in place in northeast Georgia that God swears by himself and by his word and he's bound by these words and this covenant. If you do not follow his way and shed yourself of this sickness of sin and get yourself out of the miry clay that you have found yourself in America and the world, judgment will come upon us in ways we've never seen before. It's it's already started, but a greater shaking is coming. We got a gift, but what are we going to do with it? We've got a gift. It's called time. We have an opportunity to do something, and I'm not talking about restoring the republic. I'm not talking about restoring the government. I am talking about a people who march out as remnant with faith and fire and passion for God that will preach the gospel to every single creature, to go to every single jailhouse, to go to the crack house, to go to your neighbor's house, to go everywhere and anywhere that God calls you to and preach this blessed truth no matter they shut the the door at you or fire shot at you Amen. I wish I had a witness a few weeks ago a young man up in the north gave his life for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ he was preaching with his bible in his hand and he preached the message to somebody who had full of hate and full of the devil and they shot that young man and the man died with his Bible in his hands. My question to you today and those listening, what will you die in your hands with? Should death come knocking at your door? Are you going to have around your hand a can of snuff? Would you have your hand wrapped around a wine bottle or prescription drugs? Or will you have your hands wrapped around the word of God? Shot. He was martyred. Oh, I wanted to preach that message so hard, but God held me from doing it because it wasn't time. But I'm telling you, today is the day and now is the time that there are people dying for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I salute them and I say, you are a hero to me for preaching the blessed truth. Somebody else was 
injured, what was it, the Salvation Army doing the bell and give it. Oh, the, listen, it is only a microcosm of what is coming in the near future for the Church of America. You're going to have to stand up and preach and believe this thing. You're going to have to stand up before an assassin and declare, I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. I wonder if you've got the backbone and the fortitude to do so. There are no atheists in a foxhole. I really wonder, will many in the church have the fortitude to stand up at the day and the time of their departure? And will they confess Christ or will they reject him and hide? You say, oh, I'll stand there and I'll be there. Yeah, Peter said the same thing. Until Peter was converted. I'll know if you mean that by your loyalty. God will know that by your faithfulness. God will know that by my faithfulness. And my continuing to be faithful to him. Are you back at verse 5? This is only the introduction. So if you got Christmas shopping to do, I think you got till 2. If not, I owe you. But if you will not hear these words, I swear by myself, saith the Lord, that this house shall become a desolation. God told Jeremiah, this is what I want you to do. Go to this place of authority. I want you to preach this message. I want you to tell them, tell the kings, tell the people of authority that if you don't turn, you're going to burn. If you don't shed this sin, if you don't get rid of this lasciviousness and iniquity off of your nation, you will become a desolation, and I swear it. Here's the problem. With the mindset of the American church, as we've been so graceified. I don't know if that's a word, but I just made it. We've been so graceified and so petrified that we don't think God was going to do what God said He's going to do. Ah, shut up. It's been this way for over 6,000 years, preacher man. It's been this way for over 2,000 years. Oh, we've always had sin in our country. We've always had this craziness. We've always had murders and suicides. We've never had it in such a way it is like contractions of a woman. Birth pain. And these are all the signs of what God said would be a part of the last days. And they're signs of what? The end times, which is a gift. It is a gift of time. But we refuse to believe it because we have our high-powered and high-salaried preachers telling you everything's fine. But he said, if you will not hear, the word hear, you know this, means to obey. The word Shema. If you will not hear and obey, a lot of people hear, they just don't obey. A lot of people hear this messages. A lot of people hear what I preach, but not everybody obeys it because they believe we got more time. And God would never do these things. The word desolation means laid waste or ruin. Can I tell you something? Just because you don't see a big giant combat boot coming out of heaven or a big giant hand grabbing screaming people, the reality is this, that our country is already laid to waste. We already have ruins. We already have places in America where it's going to take military power and military influence from foreign entities called the UN to even bring peace to it. And I don't have time to go over it. I don't have time to get into it because it's Christmas. You know, that ain't true. I'll sit here all day long. But you don't have the stomach to hear all that's being planned, that's taking place, that has been written in secret, that now has been made public. But there are certain places that we can't even go into. There are certain places that your GPS better not get you in the wrong spot. I don't care if you're white, black, or polka dotted. Or don't know whose you is. But everything's fine. 
Yankle doody dandy. Everything's fine. Yankle doody dandy. Everything's wonderful. Man, this is it. This is American pie and all that. Everything's beautiful. When the reality is we already are a, lace, a wasteland. We've already been laid out in destruction and ruin. We're already there. Some people have their head in the wrong place. Verse 6. For thus saith the Lord unto the king's house of Judah, Thou art Gilead unto me. Now watch God's love and grace. And the head of Lebanon, yet surely I will make thee a wilderness and the cities which are not inhabited. He said, you're like Gilead. You're like Lebanon, man. You're like the cedars. You're prosperous. You're beautiful. You are the apple of my eye. But I'm going to deal with you. I love you, but I'm going to whip you. I tell my children all that, I love you, but we won't talk. We're going to have a little talk with Jesus, have a little talk with Jesus. That's the problem. We don't talk with Jesus anymore. We don't talk to our little ones anymore. We don't bring them into the place of discipline and righteousness. But God says, I'm going to deal with it. I love you, and you're beautiful. America, you're awesome. There's none like this country when you look at prosperity and you look at the American dream and democracy and the ability to do this and do that and freely come in and freely go, even though we're watching it become a police state. The reality still is we're more freer than most countries of the world. It just hasn't hit us yet that we're in a prison planet. It hasn't hit us yet, but it's coming. I said, you're all these things. I love you, but I got to deal with you. Verse 7, watch this. I'm going to close here in just, just a little while. And I will prepare destroyers against thee. The word prepare means to sanctify, to separate, to make holy. In other words, it's like an anointing. We don't understand this in our country, and we don't understand this in the church, that God is anointing, and he is separating, he is sanctioning, and he is, sat he is sanctifying and preparing oppressors for this nation and for judgment. Why do you think the kings of the east are rising up? Why do you think China is becoming such a powerhouse? Why do you think Russia is becoming a powerhouse and has more countries that are against us than any other nation in the world? Because God is separating. He's causing this unholy alliance, if you will, to strike America in due season. Took me many years to fully grasp that. Took me many years to get my mindset fixed, if you will. But I realize, according to the word of God, no matter how big and bad we look, no matter how tough we sound, no matter how much armament we have, there is always a weak spot. Every man in this room and everybody listening to me, we all have a weak spot, no matter how big and bad we look. And America is so full of pride and so drunk on the reality of being first that we will become last. Ah, oh, preacher, you sound like you want it. Of course I don't want it. I don't desire any of these things. Man, I love my freedom. I love what I do. I've been to enough foreign countries to come back to America and kiss the ground and say, thank God for America. But when I look at the word of God and he says, I swear by myself. I swear by myself, I will make you a desolation. Well, I don't know about that. Go read the New Testament. Go read the hour of the last days. Go read Matthew chapter 24. Go read and see what Jesus had to say about the end times and the times of great sorrow. It's a gift. We have it now. The American church has a gift. We have time. We have time to stand up and preach like I'm preaching right now before they shut me down. There'll come a day. There'll come a day. They're already doing it on certain media platforms that you can't preach the truth. You can't declare the truth. You can't be conservative. You can't be righteous. 
I don't care how, I don't know how God's going to do it. I don't care what man does, but God's going to find a way to get this voice and your voice out to the world. I may beat him to the punch and just quit it anyways. I can't stand most social media. Because most people who write things uh, cowardly hide behind a moncure. Come on, some, some of y'all been on, been on social media. You know what I'm talking about. They'll dog you out and their name is Chicken Lips. I mean, or Sissy Rose. Or Amazing Grace. Wow, that's pretty cool. If, if any of these names fit you, and I know you, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not talking about you. But you know it's the truth. They'll castigate you and all, and they'll hide behind this mom cure. I'm like, why don't you come on down to 580 Mia, East Main Street, Livonia, Georgia, and let's talk. Well, I'm busy right now. It's amazing how cowards in the Jezebel spirit will never confront you face to face. You say anything happened lately? No, I'm just preparing. <laughs> Watch this. I got to get out of here, man. And I will prepare destroyers. The word destroyers in the Hebrew there, it means hunters and for war. Those for hunting and those for war. Hunters and soldiers. I'm preparing for the demise of your country because of your sin. I'm preparing for these things. You say, well, I don't, I don't see anything happening across I, the, you know, the newspaper, and I don't really understand what you're talking about. The reason we don't understand is because we don't want to understand. Our government, our politicians, and just recently, and in a very uh, amplified way, our military leaders are telling us we're headed to war. But your preacher won't. Super jazzy preacher that gets on your television screen, he's not going to tell you to prepare for war. But he is. Our generals right now are telling us to prepare for war. They just told them over in Europe, prepare for war. We're going to go to war with Russia. And then another general says, get prepared for war because we're going to war with North Korea. Everybody's saying war except the preachers. Everybody's preparing for war except the Christian. Everybody's preparing for war except the consumer, the person who's so inflated with life and drunk on tomorrow's celebrations. Oh, I'll enjoy my day tomorrow, and I will wake up early in the morning like I do every Christmas and holler as loud as I can out my back door, Happy birthday, Jesus! And I'll enjoy my day. But at the same time, I'm going to prep a little bit. Y'all ain't here with me. But this is the hour that we're living in. There's destroyers being prepared. There's hunters. There's soldiers being prepared. And our own government is telling us, but yet we aren't doing nothing about it. Because we believe our favorite prophet and our favorite preacher. Watch verse 8. I'm with two more verses and I'm leaving you. And many nations shall pass by this city. And they shall say every man to his neighbor, wherefore hath the Lord done this unto this great city? I'm telling you, there's coming a funeral for America. There's coming a wake for America. And the nations who once supported us and the nations that once were defended by us will weep and they will howl for they look upon this great nation, the great city, the great mystery Babylon, and they watch it in flames. You don't believe it can happen, but God says, I swear it will because we have fallen so far from truth and verse 9 then they shall answer what's what's 9 about 9 is from verse 8 why God why did this take place there's prophets out there who are Walking in the spirit of Hananiah, telling people not to listen to those that speak doom. Honey, I don't speak doom, I speak reality. If there's something different that I'm preaching that's happening out there, if things are popping up petunia and roses, let me know about it. But the reality is we are going to hell in a handbasket. We are in this situation. And we ask why? Why are we there? Verse 9. 
Then they shall answer, because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord their God. Listen, we may not all agree on the formality of Christianity. We may not all agree on music and style. We may not agree on pageantry and design. But the reality is we better agree upon this word right here. We better agree upon the virgin birth. We better agree upon the sinless life of a lamb called Jesus Christ who died upon the cross of Calvary and rose the third day and has forgiven men of their sin. And there is no other way unto the Father but through him. And it is a sanctified, holy, consecrated life that gets us into his glory through the blood of Jesus. That's just a microcosm of truth. It's a microcosm of the creed we should have together. And they shall answer because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord. What have we done in our nation? We've forsaken the covenant. We've forsaken it inside the church where preachers don't even believe in the virgin birth. They don't even believe in holiness. They say that you can have sex outside of marriage, sex inside of marriage. It doesn't make a difference because it's only my flesh that's going through it, not my spirit. I've heard preachers tell me that we're caught in adultery and fornication to say it's just the flesh. I'm a man. No, you're a devil. You're full of the devil. You have an issue. And you can be free of that. Are your fangs hanging out just yet? Watch this. The covenant of the Lord their God and worship other gods and serve them. We worship other gods in America. We worship our flesh. We worship pornography. We worship materialism. It's never enough. Verse 10. Weep you not for the dead, neither bemoan him, but weep sore for him that goeth away. For he shall return no more, neither see his native country. There's coming a day when death will be a blessing. Those that have ever experienced war, or trauma in the medical field, sometimes death is a blessing. But there's coming a day when the greatest pain for this country will be people who held on to the lie of making America great again, who held on to the lie of the promise of prosperity and fun times forever when it all shuts down and falls around your ankles. When you recognize and realize that Jesus is the only way and that government can never save you and government is never God. America will never be great again. Brazil, you'll never be great again. Africa, you'll never be great again. All the countries of the world, you'll never be great again without the power of Jesus Christ in his shed blood. I pray that everybody would wake up to the reality of where we are this hour. I pray that you would do all that you can with the rest of the life that God has given you, this great gift called time, because we don't have a lot of it. I bless everybody here, those watching right now. I bless you in this Christmas season. I pray that you'll be blessed with your family, but I pray that you'll keep your head out of the sea of materialism and to keep it in reality of the kingdom of God. Heavenly Father, delivered your message about the gift. We've been given a gift. It's called time. It's called salvation. It's called redemption. It's called destiny. If we would just grab hold of this reality at this hour and recognize that we have a time frame that has been given to us to do something great for you because everything in life is about to change. Father, bless my people, your people. Bless everybody listening today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I love you guys. Merry Christmas.